Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining today. This is Figma for Education, Introduction to Design Systems. I'm going to be your host, Miggy Cardona. I'm also joined by Chad Bergman. Chad, you want to say hi? Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's a good morning and afternoon and evening. Maybe you're joining the middle of the night even. Thank you so much for being with us today. Awesome. Thanks, Chad. So, if you're joining us, if this is your first time, if this is a repeat time, you've been here before, make sure you let us know where you're coming from in the chat. So in the chat, make sure you set your chat to everyone. Set the chat from everyone. Let us know where you're coming from. We got folks from London. We got folks from Colombia. We got folks from Portugal, India, Denmark, Macedonia, England, France, Texas. We got folks joining in from everywhere. Let us know where you're coming from. Keep that chat going. We're going to take just a few moments to let people join this webinar. So hang tight. Uh, we got Houston, Texas, we got Finland, we got Wisconsin, we got Chicago. Myself, I'm joining in from Rochester, New York. Chad, where are you tuning in from? I am here joining in from Phoenix, Arizona. Got Phoenix, Arizona in the house. Are we, uh, how are you doing with the, uh, the the time changes there? You don't subscribe to the daylight savings time. We do not, okay? but we, instead we change our entire time zone because we don't change the hour. So you know, part of the year I live in mountain time, part of the year I live in Pacific time. So I am back That's, in Pacific right now, this time of year. That is not confusing at all. I love that. <laughs> all right, cool. So continue to let us know where we're coming in from. Uh, we're going to do just a little bit. Remember, this is introduction to design systems for students, for educators. If you're an early career individual, if you are studying at a boot camp, you're doing a bit of career switching, and you want to know the basics of Figma, of design systems, then you're in the right place. Okay, so I'm actually right now presenting from this Figma file when I hit play, basically acts like a presentation. So once again, my name is Miggy. I'm a designer advocate for education here at Figma. I'm joined by Chad, who's also a designer advocate. I know you're not explicitly design systems, but I'm going to say that you're the design systems <laughs> dot dude. So uh, you can find <laughs> us on Twitter. I'm at Miggy on Twitter. You can find Chad at dot dude on Twitter. Feel free to show us some love on Twitter. We really appreciate it. Uh, this sex session that we are hosting today, that we are running today for y'all, is being recorded. It will be shared on YouTube. It will be shared to you when it becomes available uh, after this uh, session. Usually it takes about a week, so hang in tight. So for those of you, this is being recorded. Don't feel the need to uh, try to remember everything and write down every possible note, but uh, make sure you take it all in. Make sure you set your Zoom chat to everyone so everyone can see what you're saying. But with that, please refrain from sharing links. Uh, no LinkedIn links. We just prefer that you don't. Uh, and also be kind to everyone else on this webinar, as well as everyone that we have here on stage. All right. So as I mentioned before, this is Figma for EDU, Introduction to Design Systems. I'm Miggy. Chad's here as well. So a couple things to quickly cover. Figma and FigJam are free for education. You can head on over to figma.com slash education. And what that means is you need to do a few steps. Just having an education email doesn't immediately qualify you. You have to sign up for Figma, right? So that's step one. Step two, you're going to verify your education status. You're going to head on over to figma.com slash education and verify that education status. Then number three, you're going to create an education team. The education team allows you to collaborate with other education users and unlocks all of the professional features for your Figma file. Features like design systems. So when I say feature like design systems, what I mean is libraries. You can publish libraries and share that with other folks on that team. It's also going to give you the ability to upload video and have voice chat. So not only is just signing up and verifying enough, you have to make sure you create that education team. And once again, it's entirely free if you are a verified education user. And then lastly, if you are not sure where to start, you can get started with templates. Speaking of this file that I'm currently working in right now is available for all of you. So we're going to be working out of this file today. 
Alex, uh, my esteemed colleague in Figma for Education, will be sharing that link in the chat. So grab that link from the chat and you can follow along with everything that we will be doing today. So a couple other quick thing. We run these workshops monthly. These are free for education users, for educators, for students. We want to make sure that you all have access to these very powerful tools and that you're able to collaborate with one another and that you feel empowered to do so. You can find more events just like this at figma.com slash events. So make sure you check out and see what we have in store. So we usually do different topics every month. So there will always be something new, some maybe for more beginners, some like this are going to be a little bit more advanced as we cover Figma and FigJam. So I'm going to kick us off with just a very brief introduction of how you can get the most out of some of the features that we're going to be highlighting today that can be used in coordination when working on a design system with a team. So I'm going to be talking about reusable elements in libraries. When you're working in Figma, you're going to be creating designs. You're going to create little components that can be used to make a mobile layout, to make a website that you're going to collaborate and work with engineers, with other product folks to uh, uh, work together. It's all about consistency. And that consistency comes with components, with styles, and making sure that everyone's on the same page. So right now I am on a education team. So if I click here in my file browser, I'm in this Figma for education, education team, and I am in this file. So this file is going to have a number of different things. It's going to have styles and it's going to have components. When I publish this file, I will be able to publish those styles and components so that that way they are able to be used across this team. They can be used in other files. And when they're used in other files, they're basically accessing the library of those components and styles. Likewise, whenever this education team file that has been published gets updated, right? You're going to publish those updates. Those updates are then available in those other files within that team for review. So let's kind of go over what some of that means. So some of the styles that you can use in Figma are color styles. So right here, you can see I have various color blocks. And when you have a shape and I give it a fill, and I ascribe it a color, you'll see these four dots. These four dots indicate that there is a style that can be associated with it. And I can create a style or I can use an existing style. So here you see I have yellow, light blue, light violet. These are all colors. One cool thing about these styles, we can also ascribe photos and images to those styles. So you can see I have some textures here as well. Let's close that out. And so if I were to create a new color, let's ascribe that to, let's say this color blue, and I wanna create that new style, I click up here, I can give it a name, and I can say that this is my blue. I can give a description, what it's for. And the more you get into design systems, this naming structure becomes very important and very relevant in terms of its function and how you use it. And Chad is going to be talking about that. So here you even have some more options and to how you can control the properties of that style. And then you can save that. So another style that we have here is going to be textiles. It's going to keep in touch all of the properties associated with that text. So when I click here, I can see the different textiles that I have available. So these textiles right here represent a typographic scale. This allows me to just define a few styles. So then that way I can make sure that there is consistency across my designs and across my team. And so when I say, hey, we're using this particular style, everyone's going to know and everyone's going to be on the same page. Something that not that many people are aware of is you can also ascribe grid styles. So if you're working on a mobile layout, let's say if I was to create a new frame, I'm going to press the F key. I'm going to draw out a frame. I'm going to come over here. I'm going to click on layout grid and I can choose to create, let's say a four column grid. Oops, I did rows. Let's do columns. So I have a four column layout. 
I can now save that style and import that into other files using that team library. So creating those styles and having that consistency is going to be fantastic. We also have effects. So here, if you draw a shape or object that you have on the screen, I'm going to select that. I'm going to come down here to effects. You'll see that we have drop shadow, inner shadow, layer blur. All of these can also be saved as a style. So right here, you can see that I have this color, I have a color style on it, as well as an effect style that are applying the highlight and shadow. Let's say I want to adjust those values. I click right here to the left and I can show or hide those highlights and shadows. Both are basically an inner shadow applied to that shape to give it a little bit of dimensionality. That being said, Chad is also going to be talking about components and component sets. And I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to them. Components are elements that are reusable. So here, let's say you're going to be using a lot of buttons in that interface of yours. I'm going to create it as a component. And then that component can have instances. If I was to make a change to that main component, it's going to impact all of those instances. So if I was to, let's say, change the color here of this component, you will see that reflected. Those instances, they also have overrides. So if I wish I can make a change uh, to this here by adjusting the text. So I'll say for this button, um, I will say hello world. Uh, you can use this in conjunction with auto layout to have more flexible buttons. And those components are going to come together to make elements such as this, like a authored card post. So here, what I can do is I can actually place an image onto this uh, and have its instances be a little bit different and make a mobile feed. So I'm going to select these out over here. I'm going to hit Command-Shift-K or Control-Shift-K to place an image. And let's grab a image. I'm in the wrong file here. Let's see. Let me go to my documents and let's go to my assets folder. And I'm going to grab a few images here. And then within these instances, oops, this is not updating. Oh, let me break. I just have to break that style there. Let me do that one more time. And uh, here I'll be able to drop those images in. And you can see I can begin to customize this and create a mobile feed. Now it doesn't stop there. There's going to be component sets that allows you to create a variety of variants. So these are sets of components that have predefined values for others to use that. So when you think about design systems, you think about those that create the design systems, those that maintain the design systems and those that use the design systems, as well as though that may contribute to them. So you have a set of standards that you're effectively working on together. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Chad to go a little bit more in depth on the hows, the whys, and you know all of the best practices that, that you can have when getting started. Awesome. Thank you so much, Miggy. You know, great, great introduction there. And you know, also a great segue you know, when we think about design systems and how we work with them. You know, let's really start at the beginning, right? What are design systems? And, you know, when we think about them, you know, we're talking about design, whether product design, brand, content, um, somewhere in the conversation, the term design system is likely going to come up. But really, what is a design system? Um, Nielsen Norman Group, uh, they define a design system as really a set of standards to manage design at scale, um, reducing redundancy, creating shared language, visual consistency um, across different pages and channels. Um, you ask Dan Mall. Dan Mall says design systems bring order and consistency to digital products, um, helping protect brand, elevate user experience, increase speed and efficiency of how we design and build products. Um, we also love to ask this question out on Twitter and other social channels as well. And just even what the community has to say about what design systems are. You know, if we take a look at some of these tweets, we can pull a few patterns out of this that really say the same thing. They offer guidance. They are a shared language, creating efficiency and consistency. 
So if we think about what is the design system, you know, in a simplified way, I like to say they're an informed and guided collection of resources to help enable teams design and build products. But when did design systems, you know, really start? Because the term design systems, it's still relatively new. Um, it really started to gain traction after Brad Frost introduced the atomic design principle. And the basis actually really dates back to around the 1960s. Um, if there's familiarity with graphic standards manuals, um, some of the most recognizable, um, the EPA, NASA, New York City Transit Authority, um, those graphic standards really set the tone for how things should be created. And that really started translating over to the web and product design in um, roughly like mid 2000s, you know, when we'd start to see defined patterns, documentation in the form of style guides, we'd see UI kit assets, and really they've all continued to evolve. So today when we are talking about design systems or you're just getting started and discovering um, some of the systems that are out there and publicly available to learn from, um, a few of the larger ones in the community that are often referenced and come to mind, um, you may have heard of Shopify Polaris, IBM Carbon, Atlassian Design System. Um, maybe you have heard of them, maybe you've checked them out yourself, but they really show how things have evolved from the graphic standards manuals of the past all the way through these new digital design systems. So a question you may ask is, why have a design system and how do they help? And Miggy kind of said a little bit of this as well as when we talked about what are design systems. You know, two of the most common benefits talked about with design systems are creating consistency and helping with efficiency. And really design systems, they aim to solve the small repeatable patterns or small repeatable problems. And enable teams to really focus on solving and crafting a deeper experience. Um, design systems, they're not intended to hinder creativity, but it's really to make it so teams don't need to be worrying about what a button should look like and making one over and over again. To really focus on solving the deeper challenges of an experience. Now, these are the two that you'll most commonly hear about for why have a design system to help with consistency and efficiency, but there are additional benefits. And personally, I think that they're a great educational resource. Um, really when you're starting in a maker related role at a company, um, they can really help get up to speed. Um, they can also help lead to a more collaborative culture through um, contributions to a design system and growth as it becomes a reflection of those who consume it. And they can help teams really create a cohesiveness from one part of experience of an experience to the next. But what about Figma? So we're here today, we're talking about working with design systems in Figma. And you know, we want to say a design system, it's not just Figma. And as Miggy shared, design system assets like styles and components, those are the things that we work with in Figma pretty much daily if we're in a creative role. And these shared resources, they're often some of the most visible parts of a design system. And so when we're talking about working with the design system, most often in our daily lives, we're talking about working with those design system assets as we're creating in Figma. Now, there may also be things like documentation or contribution workflows that take place in Figma, but we're not gonna dive into those today. They can be a little bit more advanced, but we really wanna focus on the foundationals of getting started. So Miggy shared a little bit about styles there, but let's take a look at how we can get started with um, using components inside of Figma. So in the community file, if you haven't grabbed a copy of this yet, um, definitely grab that copy from the link and you can follow along in the file here as well. Um, Miggy had some components already created there, but what happens if we don't have any components yet? 
Here we're designing this little alert here. We've built this out using some auto layout and you know, we're using an icon in here and we wanna actually turn this into a component so we can reuse this alert over and over again. The simplest way we can do this is just to select our frame here. And right at the top, we have a button to create a component. Just like that, we've now created our banner basic component. And if we wanted to use this component, we can go into our assets panel over on the side here. And I can see here for my components, here's our basic banner we've created. I can just drag this out and I can use this as I'm creating a screen here. I now have this out here. And if I want to edit this, hello, check this out. And I now can type text right here within this banner. I can reuse this over and over again, but I could also say maybe this is going to change. There's no longer a uh, rounded corner on there. Our banner now gets that. Now, what if I'm doing a little experimenting though? And as I'm working with this in this design, you know, maybe I don't want to have this icon in it here, or you know, maybe I actually want a different color for it. I'll just grab a little blue banner there. And maybe I want to, as I'm iterating on my own component here, I want to say, hey, I want this to be the uh, main component for this now. I can go here and I can actually um, push this change back and we could make this where it would become the main component afterwards. Now, if we wanted to make this even more usable, or you know, maybe we're building out a reusable component and we're going to contribute this into a system, we might want to make this a little more flexible for how we use it. And this is where component props can really be beneficial. So let's break this down and take a look at a few of the different properties that we'll want to add to our component and how that can help us when we are using these components. Now, with component properties, there's three main properties we'll use. Um, we'll talk about Boolean properties, we'll talk about text properties, and we'll also talk about instance swap properties. And Boolean properties, these are one of the most common, and they're also related to code as well. And it really allows you to toggle things on and off. In Figma, we use Boolean properties for toggling visibility of layers. And so let's go here and say, we wanna make it optional if this component can be dismissed or not. And so we're going to either show or hide this close icon based upon that property. So to do this here, I have the component selected right here, and I'm going to go down into it. I'll browse right here, and I'm going to select this layer for icon cross. And when I come over to the layer panel here, I get this icon to create a Boolean property. And I can name this, um, let's name this dismissible. And we can choose by default if we want that to be true or false. True means that it will be visible. And if we set that to false, it would be not visible by default. And we can always change this by selecting our component. And we see the property right here. We can always go in and change this setting if we do want it to be dismissible by default. Now, what this looks like, if we use this, I'll take a instance of this component here. And so if we're using this, we now see I have a toggle in the design panel. And I can turn that on or off to handle the visibility of that icon. Let's make it a little more flexible here. Let's make it easier for us to update our message text here. And text layers, we can surface this right at the top, like we just surfaced that toggle 
for the visibility of the icon. We'll do the same thing here in this component. I'm going to hold down command and just click right on the text layer to jump directly to it. And we'll see I have a content section right here. And we see the same icon. Anytime we see this icon, it means a property can be applied to this particular component. And if we go to create a text property, one thing we'll see is it defaults the value to whatever text was already there in this component. Now I'm going to give this a name. Maybe we'll just change this to message. And um, maybe we want to change this text to um, message to communicate to the user. We can see that it will grow as we type more text in there as the value. And once we create that property, it will actually update it right in the component itself. Now, when we use this and we build upon what we've created, we see here that I have that dismissible Boolean property on here. And I also have the message. So I could change this. Um, and we could just say, alert. And we can edit that text right from the side panel here. Now, we might want to just work right on the canvas. You know, if we've used this component and brought it out from a library, um, we can either edit just by selecting the instance, or if we're working right on the canvas, we can still go in and change our message. And when we change it right on the canvas here, it will also be reflected in the side panel here, even with that return that I added to the end. It'll always stay in sync. Now, the other piece of properties where we can really make this more flexible is by creating an instant swap property. Uh, this way, we don't have to dig into layers and go through and select what we want to change out. We can make it very easy to swap in other instances nested in this component. So in our banner example here, you know, we might want to make it where we could change this info icon out for any of these other icons. And the way we would do this without props, we would go expand our layer list here, we'd select the icon, and then we would just swap this out for something else. But we can actually just surface this at the top level as well by creating this instant swap property. And here we see we get a few more options when we're creating this property. So if I'm naming this icon, we can say the default. Again, it will use that info icon since that's what's here. But we can also specify some preferred values that we want to recommend that we might want to use. So if you're designing something and you know, you're planning to put some alerts in there, maybe this info is going to be the most common. So you're going to want that to be the default. But maybe you're also going to design that and you want maybe some a check for indicating success. Um, maybe we'll use this cross for an error. Um, maybe we'll also just put in there uh, our heart icon. Now, when we create that property for the instance swap, again, if we take an instance of our component here, we'll see how we've continued to iterate on this. And when we go to swap that icon out, it's going to recommend those preferred icons from this list that we've already selected. So I can quickly change that out to a check or maybe the cross. But if I do want to use a different icon that's not what's suggested, it's perfectly fine. I can go and search for any other components that I want to put in that place. So I could look at components there. I could go in and I could look for um, the icons in here as well. We can go in and pull that right through the instant swap menu. Now, the other thing we can do with our component, you know, as we're starting to add these, it might not make sense what order we have them in. So we can always rearrange them. So maybe we want to just grab the handle here 
and move that icon up top. Or you know, maybe we want at the very top here, uh, dismissible as the next option. We can set that and reorder what it appears in our instances. Now, properties can be really, really powerful, but we can also extend our components a bit further uh, by creating variants, or as we call them, component sets. And component sets and properties, when you use them together, this is where you can create and use some really, really powerful components. Uh, there's certain times that you may want to use a variant and certain times you may want to use a property. So let's take a look at first how we get started in working with a component set. Um, you'll often hear this referred to as variants. And variants are used for things like different styles, for different um, interaction states, um, anything that visually looks different beyond just showing and hiding something. So we have our banner here. We have those props that we've created. We maybe want to create a few different visual variations of this banner to use. And we'll create a few different types here. Let's create our error banner, an info banner, and a success banner. Now, the way we can do this is by selecting our component we've already created right here. And just going to the properties panel here, we'll hit the plus, and we have an option to create a variant. I'm going to select that. And we now see we have what is a called a component set. And we can see that this set has our single variant in it at the moment. And we have a new property at the side here just called property one by default. And it is set to be a default variant. Now, we know we're going to wanna to create a few different components here. So I'm just gonna hit the plus to add a variant. And let's add one more here. And it's just going to automatically name those as variant, um, different variant one, two, three, right here in the value. Here's where we can start to change these. So we have our error already. Maybe we want to uh, default our error one. And we're going to change this icon. Um, let's leave this as red here. and. We'll change this one out here to our icon here. And then jumping, jumping around here. Um, I'm going to actually detach this real quick here. And go in here. The one thing we'll see is that if we have that property on the icon, it's always going to be the same icon across all of them. So since we're going to create some very specific variants here, we're actually going to detach this property. So I'm going to just delete that icon property. And now we see we can swap these out again. So this is going to be our error. So I'm just going to say we want this to be a cross. We'll make this one our success one here. So we'll use that check. And we'll go in here and change this one. Uh, let's actually leave it just as the info. We'll make this one our info banner. Now, if we already have the styles from the library, we could use that to apply as our background fill here. So this looks like it might be the light blue. We'll apply that style to it um, on the success. Let's actually do that on our info one here. We'll make light blue. This one here, we have our success. Uh, let's give that this green one right here. And this red, let's actually give this the style as well. Uh, we'll change that to be that red orange. So we're now using those color styles to create in our component here. And we now have each of those different types. But we want to name these so we know what we're going to use. 
And when we select each individual variant in this component set, we'll see here it's the property one default. Let's actually call this like the type down below. We'll call that error. We'll call this one success. And we'll call this one info. So now when we select our component set, we have that message which will surface up to the top. And we have the dismissible that will surface at the top. And we'll also create a selector now for this property one. Now we want this to be descriptive so we know what we're going to use in our component. So let's change this and call it type. So now that we've created this set, we can take a look at how this all comes together and variants are used with properties. I'm going to come over here and we have our screen again here. And I'm going to go ahead and use the assets panel. And here we have on our component sets, we notice it's just one single component. And if we drag that out from the asset panel, we still have, if it's dismissible, we can toggle that. We can change our message here. Um, so we'll say you have added this to your cart. And we want to change this to be success. And so now we see that with having the variant, that handled changing the color of this alert for us. It also changed that icon since we designed it to always use that icon within. Now, this is a case where when you're using this, if you had that property, you could switch it out. Uh, most commonly, what you're going to find when you're using an asset from a design system, though, it's going to have some of these predefined pieces for you. So that way, it's always using the right icon and you're not left guessing. Should I be using an icon without the circle around it? Should it be this check mark? Should it be a thumbs up? Um, you don't have to guess about that and spend time thinking about that. The design system maintainers who are building these design components out, they're already going to have thought about that. So as you're changing out uh, to a different variant, you know that you're getting the right visual treatment for it, and you can focus on you know, what proper messaging should be, where these should be placed in the UI, um, really thinking through more the rest of the experience than worrying about those little pieces within there. So just a very brief introduction. These are the most common things that, as you are getting started working in Figma, these are the most common things that you're going to be working with in components. We're going to be working with a component that's just all by itself. And that's something that if you're creating, um, similar to what Miggy showed in the beginning there, maybe you're going to reuse some of these and create things like a little card. Those are things you can totally create in your file as you're building things and thinking, hey, I'm going to be reusing this over and over again. You can absolutely create components locally in your file to use while also using assets coming out of those design system library files. Now, with that, I know we have a lot of questions today, so I want to bring Miggy back as well here and really make sure that we are taking time to uh, answer all of your questions as well. And I'm back. Hey, Chad, thank you so much. I really want to give it up. Um, folks in the chat, we're just going on about just the clarity, the pace, and how fantastic you are at just explaining these concepts. So I just want to give you like, you know, big kudos for that. And it's one of the reasons why I brought you on. Um, so I have some questions for you uh, just to, to, to kind of begin here. The one thing that I want to talk about with design systems, you have folks that make design systems, you have folks that use design systems. This is a 
early career for students, for educators thinking about, you know, their introduction. Um, we, we talk about the folks who create and the folks that consume. Um, students starting are going to be consumers most likely. So what are some good practices, tips, or ways that folks getting started at a company um, can be a a better design systems consumer or what do they need to know when they're just getting started out and they're going to be using or starting at a company that may have a design system already? Yeah, it's a great question. I think my biggest piece of advice and, you know, this is really for everyone who's getting started with um, working with the design system that may already be in place. Be curious. Um, curiosity is great. You know, why were these decisions made? How are these things composed? Um, where do we use them? Why do we use them in this particular way? Um, be curious as you're using them and ask some of those questions it, because it can vary depending on how mature the design system is. You know, some companies and teams are still figuring this out and they may have a very early design system then there's also very established design systems that have been around for a decade. You know, you might have some of those things like the Shopify Polaris or the IBM Carbon that they are very in-depth systems that already have a lot of documentation around it. Um, definitely dive into that documentation. Be curious. Understand why things are created a certain way, how they're intended to be used. Um, they can be really, really helpful. Um, at the same time, also, if you are able to know, hopefully it's documented and it's shown who is a uh, design system creator or maintainer, ask questions, connect with them. Most likely if a company has a design system and design system team, they may have open office hours that you can go visit to ask questions. Um, sometimes just a friendly, email or, you know, reach out on Slack teams, um, whatever. Sometimes even a little reach out is, hey, you know, I see that you work on the system. I'm really curious about learning more about this. Could we set up a little time and chat? Um, your com the company may also have an onboarding for you in um, learning how to work with the design system. So all in all, everything I'm saying, I really bring it back to be curious. Um, just understand why. Brilliant. I love that. Curiosity is just such a good trait to have, especially when you're just joining, you're just starting. Um, I know too, just if for those of you getting started, you know, check out existing design systems. Folks mentioned Goldman Sachs uh, and that they have really good mm -hmm. outlines for, for like data tables. Um, so a lot of companies will, will publish, um, aspects of their design system, or even with like material design, you know, there is a lot of just guidance and understanding. There's a lot of intentionality on why they're doing the things they are and the decisions that they're making. So, uh, another quick question tips, if you're building or contributing to a design system. So if you're a design system creator or like maintainer, let's say you're going to be starting at a company and, you know, the expectation is on you to really kickstart that. What, what kind of tips do you have? Yeah. Um, so if you're just kind of kickstarting it and, um, getting started. I think a great starting place is there's already going to likely be something there, right? There's likely already a web presence. They likely already have a product that has been developed and is out there. And don't necessarily think you have to start from scratch and say, I'm going to define everything brand new all over again. Great starting point is just auditing what's already there. Um, if you are going across the a website or even going across the product experience and just take screenshots like crazy, you know, you'll start to see patterns emerging. You'll see, and likely with some variants to it as well. Like you might see some buttons that are 56 pixels high. Some are like 52 pixels high. You might see a few little things that are off. But those are great things that you can create consistency and alignment on as you are starting to put things together later. Um, 
get started. This, I guess maybe this also ties back to be curious, right? Curious what else is out there and existing already. Dive through it, you know, uh, documenting and auditing. Um, admittedly, that's one of my favorite pieces of it when you are getting started in um, either creating a new system or if you're even looking at um, evolving into like a V2 of a system, V3 of a system, um, just doing that discovery, the curiosity of it. Um, if it comes down to, you know, maybe you're not building this from scratch, but you're going to contribute to it. Um, kind of two thoughts there I have. Um, one, again, if it's already an established system, likely there are some type of contribution guidelines in place already. Um, hopefully there are, yes, be curious. Um, hopefully there are some guidelines in place on, hey, considerations for contribution. Um, one of the biggest pieces is thinking bigger. How would this impact and inf impact and help other teams, other pieces of the experience beyond what I'm just focused on right now? Um, if something you want to contribute to the design system is very, very tightly knit to one little niche piece of the experience that you're working on, it may not necessarily be a great contribution to a larger design system. It might be more appropriate to just be at your product level or your piece of the experience. That said, I'm going to go back to, uh, as uh, maybe put the screenshot here, be curious. Those are the questions to ask. Would this be beneficial? How would this help others go from Z back to A in a much smoother way. Cool. Um, cool. So do you want to talk about what happens as a as a design system team scales? Or I also have some questions here from the, the audience. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to uh, go to some questions from the audience, but I can just say one thing on this real quick. Um, I think as a system or even the team of its scales, um, Really, it should be come a reflection of those who are the consumers of the system, right? Like a system, it's first created based on, you know, whatever might already be there. You might start creating a system on that. But a design system is just like a product. It's always growing. It's never complete. It's always evolving. And as more people do as it becomes more mature, the team scales, maybe there becomes a large dedicated team to supporting it. You know, that's where it can really continue to evolve. And as people make contributions to it, as it accounts for more use cases, that's where the system starts to shift and it really becomes tailored and a reflection of all of those who do consume those assets from the design system. Brilliant. All right. And then somebody just mentioned design systems are alive. All right. So uh, Diego commented on my, my glasses. These are pharmaceutical grade glasses. I'm having some eye issues right now. So thanks. I appreciate you think that I look cool. All right. So um, here we got some questions. A, a, a And there's some technical questions here, but I actually want to start with this first one. Do you have any useful plugins that you use for design systems? Ah, oh, that's that. This is an endless rabbit hole we could go down. <laughs> I think that it depends on what your um, what your intended um, outcome is. Like, are you using a plugin to check things for um, accessibility purposes of annotating? Are you using it for checking contrast? Are you using plugins to generate placeholder content? Um, are you using um, plugins to annotate and leave notes. There's a lot that could be possible. I, the community has so, so many plugins out there. Um, ones that I personally find I use a lot when I'm working on, or even in the past when I've worked on design systems teams, um, the Stark and Contrast plugins are both really, really helpful. Um, because when you're creating components with design systems, you know, you want to ensure that you're baking in some level of um, accessibility focus to it. Um, just because your components in your design system 
factor accessibility though, it doesn't mean an accessible experience will be created. That goes back to the really solve those uh, challenges later. Um, content Reel is a good plugin I like to use from just generating some quick content to drop into um, components in a system. Um, there's other plugins I've used in the past for like style management and moving things. But honestly, Figma has now built those features in natively within Figma. So there's not a lot of those plugins that necessarily need to be used anymore. Um, you use Styler? I have used Styler in the past, yes. Um, I, I tend to not really use it as much anymore. Um, another one also, but it can still help, is uh, Simulayer. Um, if you're looking to make multiple changes to multiple um, layers, Simulayer can help. Um, little spoiler, if you are working with components, uh, component sets, um, you can now select all matching layers within a component set and do some of that bulk updating as well. Um, so I find I use Simulayer less now as well. Um, but similar is another one that's really helpful. All right, cool. I'm just I'm just say, doing a, a couple of. Is my screen shared? Can everybody see my screen? I'm I'm gonna assume such. Yeah, gonna Mickey, we can see it. Similar. All right, perfect. Thank you. Um, cool. So, uh, someone here uh, uh, actually asked a technical question. I, I answered, but um, so they're creating co product card components. They're having trouble changing the photo, and so they're detaching the instances to do so. Are they doing something wrong there? I know what they're doing. How about you, Chad? <laughs> well, I think this comes into the um, how the component is made up, and I think Miggy did a cool demo on this in the beginning there. Um, one thing to keep in mind is what, like here we have the blue um, square. Um, it should be a shape in order for you to swap that out and place a photo in there. Um, if you're just putting a frame there as the placeholder or putting a fill on the frame, um, you won't be able to just do that place image and quickly swap that out in the component um, like Miggy did there. Um, yeah, so if I do command forward slash place image, right, I can grab an image from my desktop. I can put the image here. So the thing is, is that all images are just fills on layers. And I actually made a mistake earlier because this instance here has a style applied to it. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be difficult to paste over. So I'm just going to break that style going to copy the fill. So every fill that you have is just a little layer over here. You can select it in the left. I'm going to copy that. And I'm going to command click here. And I'm going to paste it. So you can apply that image without having to detach or, or, or break it at all. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's another approach that can also be taken there to, um, you know, if again, you don't want to have the, um, fill style applied to it. But if you're creating that card, you could default the fill type to be an image. Um, so right there where maybe has the 555, one FF there, you could just go ahead and change this and in the main component, just make it to be an image. So then when any instance of that is used, um, you could go in, select and change what image. So that's another way that I have approached this. I've seen other teams approach it this way as well. Um, there are options in how you architect that component. Yep. So using that like little grid, it's it's more of a visual indicator for those that you're working with. So then that way it's easier for them to swap that as an image. Uh, video would be uh, the same. Uh, the video behaves just like an image, but to use video, you need uh, an education team, a pro team or higher, and the file does need to be on a team. Video, you won't be able to upload in a draft. Uh, the video itself can be previewed. So if I was to add a, a video here, I'm going to place it just like I would an image. I'm going to click here. And so this video, to know it's a video, you'll see the video layer and you can preview it here. You won't see the video play live in the editor um, and you could play it. It'll only play in the prototype and you'll see that. So uh, check out the video in prototypes playground. I will post a link in the chat. 
All right, cool. Uh, let's head back over to the uh, Q&A. Um, so someone asked, you mentioned that you can apply a change on an asset back to the master component or the main component, um, but they didn't see how you did it. Can you show that one more time, Chad? Oh, yes. I thought my screen had frozen there and apparently it did freeze at that point. So um, I will share here real quick. And right, I'm going to stop. There you go. All right. So we'll just take this one where we've left off here. I may, I'm just going to round this a bit more. Um, you know, we could go here. And now this is something where if you're, if you're creating your own components locally in a file, this is much, much easier process. You know, I've made this where maybe I want the alert to be uh, 48 pixels on the corner radius there. I can go here and I can just push these changes to the main component. So hitting this overflow here, um, now that I've pushed it, I don't have any changes, so I can't do that. But we go back and we look and we see I've changed that and pushed it back right to this. Um, same thing if we were looking here, maybe I wanted to um, detach that red orange or you know make uh, we're already using green, so let's make this violet. Um, same thing, I could go here and I could push this change to the main component. And we'll see that that has changed back on the main component here. Brilliant. I'm going to be sharing the, uh, the video prototypes playground. So I just shared that file in the link because I saw there was people asking some additional questions. Um, so someone actually asked a, fantastic, a, a great question. Uh, so when working with components, I'm going to take a screenshot of it and I'm going to share my screen. So then that way everyone can see that. Uh, let me go back to my screen here. Okay. Um, so someone asked, when working with components and component props and sets of variants, would you say the best way to go about it is creating a component, determining the properties of that component, and then creating the variants? Or would this would this be the right order? Um, or is it the 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 other way around? Do you do you make the variants and then begin to ascribe the properties, Chad? Oh, that is a great question. Um, the answer is it doesn't matter. Uh, you can do either way. It's what works best for you. Um, you can start out with an absolutely basic component. Um, most often, you're probably going to start with creating variants first uh, because you would use variants for things like interaction states. So if we were making a button as an example and we're designing our primary button, we also then want to design what it looks like in a hovered state or a pressed state. Um, those You would use variants to create those. So you'll probably already have a component set created and then adding properties to it. Um, at the same time, you might just have a single component, add the properties to define it, and then create the component set of then what the various states look like. Both ways, perfectly acceptable. Both ways will get you to the exact same result. So yeah, the one the one value that you have with component properties is that you can select that object and then target matching layers. So you can apply the property across all three. So here, if I wanted to adjust that text, I can select that text, find the matching layers in the variants, and then create that property there. Uh, but yeah, Maybe just as you might have the wrong, might have the wrong screen shared here if you're showing. That oh, no. Action. Do you not see my screen? No, I, I, I'm seeing the videos playground file. Oh no, my bad. I thought I was, how about you're, now? You're going through it so smoothly. I'm like, oh, yeah. we totally got to show this. All right, cool. Yeah, so this is what I'm showing. Um, so here, the, these are buttons. If I command click on this text field, you'll see this little icon show up and then it allows me to select all of the matching layers uh, in the component set. So all of these, these variants are now available. So when I select that, I can come over here. So let's say if there wasn't that value, I can go here and, and create that property or I can ascribe it to that property. And if I was to create a, a new, new button, all caps there for that button, um, I made this super fast. But when I select that concept, I could also create the property here um, and say, you know, oops, let me take off my caps lock 
but in text and let's put some real you know uh, but in label and i can now create that that property and that pr property has now been created so it doesn't matter on your flow as as you're creating just just find that consistency um make sure you troubleshoot and you test these out i think that when you're when you're making um and you're you're creating a design system from scratch really you should be working from you know like make the design out and starting start to see you know what people need and how people need it communicated so someone asked earlier in the q and a i answered with a with a chat they were saying how do you define or how do you come up with the proper naming conventions and the naming conventions, the most important aspect of it is that it's communicable and it's understood with people on your teams. So mm -hmm. the design system is kind of this gathering point where everybody is understanding what's being used and how to how to use it. And if there is maybe a name or a nomenclature or something that might be, you know, confusing, maybe the culture of your team, you know needs a, a different name or a different way of ascribing it based off of the product that you may be working on. So, you know, a, a button for like one team may actually be something, you know, slightly different because they might have so many buttons that might needs to be more, more functional or, or contextual. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's exactly like uh, getting into the, yes, the underlying piece of it may be consistent, but it's all about, is it cohesive? Does it, it has very specific use cases. It might be slightly different, but does it still feel like it's a part of that same experience? Yep. All right, cool. Well, thank you, Chad, so much for joining us on this live stream. Um, and for those of you, I know you you have your building blocks, uh, uh, design systems, uh, YouTube videos, right? Yeah, it's a, another great place if you are looking at, you know, exactly that scenario, hey, you're going to start building a system and have like no idea where to begin or should you, um, you can definitely check out on the Figma YouTube channel. We have an entire series on there called Building Blocks, where we go from zero to 100 on uh, considerations for getting started and how to utilize some of the Figma features to um, help build out some of that side of your system assets, as well as talking about things like documentation, contribution models, and even more. Brilliant. I was just looking for that. Um, so yeah, check out youtube.com slash at Figma, um, and you can find those building blocks videos. All right, cool. And hey, Chad uh, Alex... and Miggy, I'm going to jump in for one second because I think somebody in the chat said that they want you to just stay on this um, webinar all day and show them cool stuff, which I know we absolutely could. Three quick announcements from the Figma for Education team. The first is I'm dropping a feedback survey in the chat. We would love your feedback and ideas for sessions in the future. We want to know what you thought. So first thing to do is give us your session feedback. The second thing I'm going to drop is we do these workshops every single month. They are free. So please go ahead and register. I also dropped that link in the chat for you to register. And the third thing I'll say is that we're recording all of these sessions and putting them on YouTube and we will email them to you within one week. So remember session feedback, sign up for next month's workshop and definitely check out the workshop recordings on YouTube. But in the meantime, thank you so much for coming and Miggy, I'll pass it off to you for a goodbye. All right, cool. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Chad. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. This is really fun. This has been really special. So um, hope you all have a fantastic weekend. And uh, yeah, Chad, sign us off. Yes, thank you all so much. Great to be here today as well. Uh, definitely don't be strangers. Say hello. All right. Bye, y'all. Bye.